On Saturday, November 9th, you can watch a live Notebook on Cities and Culture conversation at the New Urbanism Film Festival at Los Angeles' Acme Theater. The festival, which runs from November 7th to the 10th, moves the conversation about urban planning out of the textbook, beyond the council chambers, and into the movie theater. For more details on the full schedule, visit newurbanismfilmfestival.com. Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture, online at polarinertia.com, and Medivate, a community and set of tools to help you build the kind of meditation practice you'd like to have, online at medivate.com. a driving question of this book is how can the man who designed Union Station, the Memorial Coliseum, Willis Wilshire at Los Angeles City Hall be literally unknown? Is that do I have that right? I, th- I think you have that absolutely right, and that that's been a, a question that's kind of uh, driven this whole project and given purpose for this project. Um, you would, you would think in any other city in America, at least amongst those people that cared about architecture, that if there were an architect that, that had the same uh, resume of significant structures, that he would be a household name, and he, and he would be the house, at least a household name amongst people who cared about architecture. Um, I, I, was, I was amazed that there really is a, so f- few people in, along this process who really understood who he was. And, you know, anywhere else you would think it, this would be fifth, sixth, seventh book about John Parkinson. And it's remarkable that it's really the, fir- the first book about a guy who's arguably the, the greatest architect in the history of the city. It is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting down here above downtown Los Angeles in the U.S. Bank Tower, talking to Stephen G., who was a senior producer at ITV Studios and the author of the new book, Iconic Vision, John Parkinson, Architect of Los Angeles. I was mentioning to you just off mic beforehand how I come from Koreatown to downtown often, and thus I pass the Bullock's Wilshire building, and I have admired it many times, and as I've admired the other buildings you write about show the development of in Iconic Vision, but yours was, of course, the book that told me one man designed these buildings. I wager to say anybody who lives in Los Angeles fairly often is in sight of a uh, of a Parkinson building, more, maybe more now than in the last 30 years, you think? I think, um, obviously, there's a resurgence of downtown, but I, I think it's, you know, what always gets me is, is, is there's so much attention in Los Angeles on architects such as Neutra and Schindler that really made it their reputations uh, designing expensive private houses or private residences. Uh, John Parkinson designed the public structures that 78 years after his death still define Los Angeles. Um, I don't think, I think if you'd walked along Broadway or Spring Street and you just randomly asked people if they recognize these structures, they they could recognize most of the, the key structures. They're, they're that iconic to the city. People often write that Los Angeles is a city nearly without public spaces and nearly without recognizable landmarks architecturally, but Parkinson, Parkinson's career proves that's not literally true, right? Yeah, I mean, um, Los Angeles City Hall is perhaps the most iconic structure in, in all of California. Um, the Union Station is an incredible landmark that's appeared in numerous movies. Uh, the thing about Parkinson structures, if you look at it from a Hollywood perspective, they really are the buildings that Hollywood uses to identify a location as being Los Angeles. Right, right. I mean, the Blade Runner uh, police station is Union Station, and I'm sure movie usages, you you came across very many besides that one. Uh, li- lit- literally hundreds. Mm-hmm. H- hund- hundreds and <laughs> hundreds. To, I mean, too, too many to sort of almost like, you know, rattle off an endless list of them. But yes. I mean, you know, just looking at City Hall, so, you know, being destroyed in War of the Worlds, it's such a, such an iconic image just by itself, regardless of the building. So you mentioned the mid-century modern architects designing expensive houses and them getting a lot of the glory that is available in Los Angeles today, even today. Is that the only reason Parkinson is so little known today, is that there was just this boom of houses? 
No, not not uh, not at all. I mean, uh, John Parkinson's son died ten years after his father in 1945. Um, his grandson, who many people expected would take over the firm, died within ten years of that. So that there was nobody really to champion the Parkinson legacy. Uh, there was there was nobody to promote the the firm, and what they did kind of fizzled out slowly over a long a long period of time. For academics, perhaps because Parkinson, when he came here, was working on perhaps creating an East Coast style city on the West Coast is not as interesting. But when you look later in his career, particularly. Uh, when his son Donald joins the firm, you see a lot of the innovation that really gets academics excited. So there are those things, but I think uh, because so much of what the original LA was supposed to represent already existed somewhere else, I think that's probably why people haven't been uh, haven't studied him to the degree that perhaps they should have done. The Los Angeles of, of Parkinson, in other words, was perhaps a Los Angeles that wanted to adapt existing city forms to its own ways rather than one that wanted to invent a new city form, which is famously the way people would write about it in the 60s, 70s, even the 50s, right? Yeah, in, in, in some ways, but I mean, um, without wishing to sort of contradict myself completely, I mean, Parkin the thing that always set Parkinson apart uh, from other architects, um, whether it was in Los Angeles or Seattle, is that he was obsessed with the latest architectural techniques. Mm. He was obsessed... Um, elevators, especially. Uh, elevators, um, you know, fireproof technology, mm. any, anything that he could do to make that the most cutting edge that can be, and often with technology that he, that he would develop himself. Mm. So, I mean, I'm doing him a little bit of a disservice when I'm saying, you know, that he was creating just an East Coast city. Mm. I think what he wanted to create was a, a beautiful city that really left people inspired by their surroundings. Mm. How, if you're talking to a non-architect, do you describe the style, the aesthetic of a John Parkinson building? I think the consistent feature that you see in all Parkinson buildings is that they're very neat. Mm. Uh, they're very elegant. Uh, they're well, they're well organized. Uh, they're very classy. There's a real absence of any kind of gaudy decoration. Mm. I mean, there are certain buildings downtown that you look at and you know instantly that it's not a Parkinson building because he would never stick some of the decoration on it that you see. It's just, it's just not him. It's very classy. And even when you get into, uh, uh Bullock's Wilshire, which is a very daring artistic, uh, architectural expression, it still all fits. It all works together. It, you don't look at it and think, God, that's, that, that doesn't work. It just, you just look at it and think, what a, beautiful, graceful structure. Mm. Do you remember, before you knew who Parkinson was, what the first Parkinson building is that you really noticed, that you took the time to appreciate? Well, I mean, when I first started working in downtown, I did a lot of tours, I did a, lo I did a lot of um, reading to kind of understand the history. It was, a, it was a real new surrounding to me. And one of the one of the buildings that first caught my eye was the Title Guarantee Building, um, it's an Art Deco structure with a setback Gothic tower that overlooks uh, uh, Pershing Square. That it's really unlike any other building in the area. And I just remember going back and, and googling uh, that building, and then it said designed by John Parkinson. And then I looked underneath it, and it said uh, John Parkinson was an Englishman. Mm -hmm. And and not only was he an Englishman, but he was from Scorton in Lancashire, the same county, not not the same uh, town, but the same county that my father's from. And that's really how this whole project got started, because I just wanted to find out more about who he was. Mm -hmm. And initially it turned up nothing but that blurb, right? Initially, I could, could I, 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 it took me weeks of looking just to find a photograph. Mm. You know, and there uh, are several in this book. This is not short of photographs on the man of the man himself. So you must have had to do some deep digging. Yeah, I did, but I mean, you know, a lot of these photographs that are in this book, um, even the collections that I got them from, or the families members that gave them to me, these are the first time that they've been seen. Oh. These are not photographs that have been reproduced any any anywhere else. So um, I had to work. I had to work hard to find them. But when you get back and you read the the newspapers of the period and that Parkinson was operated in, his name's everywhere. You know, when a celebrity of his day. 
in, yeah, in, a, in, a, in a way, amongst city leaders, absolutely everybody would know if you were involved in the construction industry or if you were involved in politics in Los Angeles, you would absolutely know who he was. I mean, when he died, it was on the front page, you know, of many of the newspapers of the time. So it, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a, an expectation, at least in the way that his obituaries were written, that he would be remembered long, long after his death, mm -hmm. that he would be a household name for generations to come. Mm -hmm. And it's taken... It's taken a long time for a project of the scale of Iconic Vision to even come around. So how quickly, how quickly was it before the name was forgotten for a time? Um, I think probably the, 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 the dividing point in, in the history would be the Second World War. Mm. You know, people probably just got so wrapped up and came back to work and back to projects after the Second World War that they looked at things completely different. There was a, it was a, it, and I, I think that's probably because uh, John Parkinson's son died in 1945, a real defining moment for Parkinson's legacy because, you know, not only did the city change after that, but the way that they looked at things changed after that. Mm. Now, though there wasn't a lot of information at hand about Parkinson himself, given the buildings that he built, when we, especially the ones that are on the cover here, such as City Hall or Union Station, there's, there had to have been no shortage on the nature of his projects themselves, the building of those projects, right? The actual, the buildings had information on them, less so the man. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And I mean, the, there's a lot of information out there, but it's in a lot of different places. And it, it really, the, putting this book together, I mean, the part that I enjoyed the most was the research because I had to go to so many different places and pick little pieces of information together. Yeah. I mean, sometimes... You know, it would be it would be a you know it'd take a day just to find out one minute little thing, but you know that's that's part of the joy of working on a project like this. If you don't love that level of research, it would be very difficult to pull it off. Now, how wide and far in the city would you have to go to find this information? Because it's not all across the street at the library down there. No, I mean I've been I've been to every kind of research center, every 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 library. Um, you know, I even I, I even went as far as I went back to Scotland in Lancashire, where uh, John Parkinson was from. I spent several weeks in uh, Seattle, just sitting, going through old newspaper cuttings, just to find anything, um, any, anywhere that it was possible to go. I feel like I've gone. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's places that in this process that I missed, but I tried as hard as I could to go everywhere. When you started. When the information really started to come in on Parkinson, what sort of a man did you begin to discover? Well, I, th I think um, the thing that always appealed to me about John Parkinson is that because he wasn't sort of educated in Paris or Paris, some expensive academy or Paris or Rome, uh, because he has no real formal education, he's a self-taught man, that I, I liked that about him. I liked the fact that he was basically a, a working-class kid that w was raised in a way that had enough self-belief in himself that he could make something out of his life. Mm. You know, and he was really uh, dedicated to doing every, taking every opportunity that he had. And I, I think that working class grounding never left him. Mm. You know, even when you see his kids um, mixed around with the uh, top social climbers in Los Angeles, you know, you still know that John Parkinson is essentially a mature working class kid from, um, you know, Lancashire in England. In so many ways, this sounds like the quintessential American story, especially of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, made, I suppose, even more quintessential by the fact that he was from somewhere else. I mean, this is not, this is not a life in architecture that could necessarily have happened in England at that time, right? No, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it really is an, it is an, a classic American story. You look at somebody that um, came to America just for fun with $5 in a toolbox and leaves a legacy that defines a major metropolis. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't happen anywhere else in the world. You know, John Parkinson went back to Britain at one point after he'd risen to become the, the foreman of a sawmill mm -hmm. in this country and tried to get a job back in Britain, and they weren't interested that nobody would recognize his experience, and they wanted to put him back at a level just above that of an apprentice. Mm. And I think John Parkinson loved America. I think he loved California mm. because 
it was really a place that made his vision possible. Mm. Throughout the eras of Los Angeles, I've long been interested in seeing and in, in understanding the, the, the ways that Englishmen have engaged with this city. And I suppose John Parkinson is one of the earliest stories that I've read in detail of, of somebody coming here from England and finding it, so, you know, some will say they like it because it's the opposite of England here. Some will say they like it because uh, there's the beach here. Some will, you know, why, why did, what did you find so appealing about Los Angeles in 1995? Was it you came over here? Well, yeah, I, I, moved, I moved here in, 90, in 1995. Um, I knew a little bit more than John Parkinson. And when John, John Parkinson um, decided to move to California, all, all he knew about um, California is that in his words, it was a, a warm, tropical country where you would uh, be well advised to be polite to avoid being shot or stabbed. I, I knew a little bit more about it than that. But the other Wild West idea. Yeah, I, I didn't know that much more. I mean, I only came here on a short-term work posting, and it was, I mean, I was literally told on the Monday that I'd have to move here, and I moved here on the Saturday. But I, you know, I was roughly the same age as John Parkinson when he came here, which is, in some ways allowed me to to look at Los Angeles through his eyes and imagine some of the, um, you know, expatriate experiences that he was going through being so far away from home. Tell me about the Los Angeles of 1995 that you came into. What was that like? For me, for me personally. Yeah, you came into it almost, 1995 is not a world apart from now, but it's a different kind of a place than it is now, is it not? And what was it like for you to come into it? Um... I mean, Los Angeles, for, I think for anybody that moves here, is, is a city that you need to get used to. Mm. You know, I mean, all those uh, traditional models of having a, uh, a, you know, a downtown area where you walk around and everybody, you know, goes to work, it, it don't really work in, this, in the same way here. It takes some getting used to. I had to live here for several, several years before you really understand how it, how it works. But, mm. you know, the great, the great thing about Los Angeles is that over time, the longer that you live here, the more that you learn about the city, the more that you, you learn to love the city. And I think for me, um, moving downtown and just really discovering and immersing myself in the history of Los Angeles was really just the, a part of my evolution of, of living here and learn, just finding another way to love the city, really. What are some of the, the realizations you made over the years, architectural, geographical, social historical, any kind, that, as you say, helped you to love this place or to, to even engage with the city better? What, what are some of the things you found out or had, had to find out or some of the pieces of information about this place that helped you in, uh, lock into it, shall we say? That's a good question. Not always easily explainable in terms of what the, what the actual fact was that you learned, but what, what kinds of things would you, would you learn that, that lets you figure this place out um, I think I think once you uh, once you understand the original intention of Los Angeles mm -hmm. if, if you understand that there was um, this desire to build a, a major East Coast city and and then everything else kind of grew out from that all these rolling suburbs suddenly start to make more sense mm -hmm. um, one of the things about Los Angeles is that it, it doesn't really take that much time to really consider its history. It's such a forward-looking city that it, it's almost too forward-looking to the expense of people like John Parkinson, and that's perhaps another reason why uh, his, his legacy isn't what it should be. Mm. You mentioned the rolling suburbs here. I, people will make fun of, say, the, the garden towns outside London as having no real reason to exist. One of the strange things in Los Angeles is, is that there are, there are reasons you would go to the suburbs, which is a striking contrast to a lot of cities, isn't it? Absolutely. But one of the, um, I mean, one of the, one of the most fantastic things about living in LA is that you, you could live here, uh, for 50 years and still does, you know, discover new neighborhoods, uh, new parts of the city that have their own history and their own identity. Mm -hmm. It's, it's because it's such an enormous city with such a diverse population and it's, um, it's one of those places, a bit like London, that you never really get bored with. Mm -hmm. And if you're really bored with it, it's because you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> 
Indeed, you know, we could quote Dr. Johnson, but I think everybody knows which line we would be quoting. Does your fascination with architecture extend back to before you discovered John Parkinson? Did you, were you already interested in architecture? Uh, I think I, more than architecture, I was always interested in history. Mm. Um, a lot of what I've learned about architecture has been purely self-taught because I was so fascinating, so fascinated by Parkinson. Mm. Um, L- LA is an incredible city, and there really, there really is a, a, a lot to learn about so many, so many of the buildings here, and there's so many stories to be written and told that haven't been. Mm. You mentioned before we rec- started recording that with the Parkinson project, the more you learned about him, the more desire you had to learn the remainder of the knowledge about him. You know, the more you know, the more you crave knowing more. It works the same way with Los Angeles itself, does it not? You know, knowing that you can never know everything about a city like this makes you want to try. And the more you do learn, then the greater craving you have to learn about the rest of it, right? Yeah, I, th- I think... The, um, I think the rest of the world is fed to a certain limited number of images of Los Angeles and, and ideas of what it is. I mean, obviously, because the movie industry is based here, uh, a lot of people even just coming to visit from England have a certain perception of what it's going to be like. Mm. I mean, they assume that it's basically one expanded version of uh, the worst parts of Beverly Hills, <laughs> uh, which, it, which it really isn't. You know, and there, there, are so, there are so many parts of Los Angeles that deserve to be discovered, discovered and enjoyed that I think if you come and visit that you would never go to because that's not what you're sold. Right. It's, the, the, there's a certain sense in which the visitor, the visitor is in an impossible situation because they, they know certain things about Los Angeles, but not, they don't really know how those parts fit in with the rest of the city or how the city as a whole is, do they? No, I mean, one of the interesting things about working downtown is that we often meet British people on the street who, and we start talking to them just randomly. And then you, you, you'll say, well, how did you end up staying downtown? And they'll say, well, it, it just made sense. It was downtown. And I, you know, I, I, and they, I think a lot of the times they, they're not getting what they expect. Mm. I think they almost expect like a, a Sydney or some, some kind of city that's more, uh, you know, by the sea right. and has that kind of lifestyle. Mm. But in a way, in 1995, downtown would have been the wrong place to stay. In 2013, it's almost come back around where that does make sense. And it's, in a way, the, the, uh, the city has caught up with uh, the sort of John Parkinson idea. You know, you're, you are near to, if not the center, then certainly a center here again, are you not? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. I mean, there, there, there's a, a resurgence of this idea that you can you know, live in a central part of a city and walk around in the same way that you would in, you know, New York, New York or Chicago. And there are now uh, thousands of people who live and work every single day in Parkinson structures. Mm. And one of the things that was appealing to me about finding out more about him is just that his work and his buildings are as relevant today as they were on the day that they opened. Mm. You know, Union Station is still the main railroad gateway to the city. Um, Union, uh, uh, the City Hall is still the main hub of political power. The Coliseum is still perhaps the most storied venue. Uh, and every time we, we, we talk about an, uh, another Olympic bid for Los Angeles, you see a picture of the Coliseum almost uh, accepting that that will be part of a, of a bid to bring the games here for a third time. Right, right. Why, why not include it for the third Olympics? You know, that's it's it's... It does seem inevitable in that way. You know, you can't, this is, this is an unignorable icon, uh, of, uh, the Olympic spirit here. I, I, absolutely. I think it would be fantastic. You know, there's so much history within that building and it, it, it's so much more than, um, really a sporting venue. Because when you, when you think about the time that that, uh, the Coliseum came, came to life, uh, and that, that bid to, to bring the Olympic Games to Los Angeles, it was really saying that we believe that Los Angeles really is the city of the future. You know, 20 years before that bid went in, LA had a population of just over 100,000 people, and here they are bidding for the biggest sporting event in the world. It's an incredibly bold statement of the possibility of the city. You mentioned the continued relevance of Parkinson's buildings downtown. Of course, even outside of downtown, Bullock's Wilshire is is the Southwestern Law School. some of the buildings downtown have been renovated and people now live in them. Union Station is now a hub of, of the uh, 
of the rail system within the city rather than simply the system uh, leading away from the city, uh, but it's both intra and interurban uh, now. How much how much of a shift has there been? How many how much of a shift in usage has there been in Parkinson's buildings? How much how far away have they moved from uses he would have envisioned or could have envisioned for them? Well, obviously, um, a, a lot of office buildings um, have been converted into apartments. I mean, that's a trend that's been going on downtown for quite quite some years. But I think the essence of what they were intended to be is still there. I mean, if you you know if you still go go to the title guarantee building, for example, and you stand and look in the um, uh, stand and look in the lobby, it still looks exactly the same. Mm-hmm. You know, um, over the years, the, the function or the purpose of those offices, and obviously that built, that's a building that's eventually going to have apartments in it, has changed. But as a, as a recognizable structure, they've really not changed that much. Mm. I think, to me, that's one of the really fascinating things about downtown Los Angeles, that because it went through this whole period where, you know, a lot of people stopped coming here, a lot of investment stopped, a lot of these buildings weren't renovated in a way that destroyed their character. So you now when we come and um, look about them being converted to apartments, you, you hear the owners of these buildings talking about how important it is to maintain the history. Mm. You know, And I think if it had been in uh, New York or Chicago where that real estate had been consistently valuable, you would have lost a lot of the character that still exists in these buildings. Mm. They didn't have... Yes, they, there wasn't a loss of the basic form of any of these buildings. There wasn't even any situation like uh, the Los Angeles Times building where they built the other building onto it. Um, in When was that, the 60s? Right. In the 60s. But Parkinson's building, some of them did go through quite bad times, did they not? I mean, Union Station had uh, some dead years in the 80s, and uh, some uh, the, the, the hotel buildings also were in, the, in that grim period of a sort of residential hotel usage, as they say, right? Just use one example. You mentioned hotels. You look at the Hotel Alexandria, opened in 1906. I mean, this was the city's first world-class hotel. Uh, I mean, it was intended to uh, rival the opulence of the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. It was phenomenal. I mean, there was literally no expense spared on any part of this structure. I mean, the initial cost was $800,000. It went on to cost over $2 million. You look at it now, and you it's its definitely seen better times, yes. absolutely better, seen better times. But who knows? It could mm-hmm. come back. It's seen better times than today, but it seems like today is a better time for even that building than 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, the part that that building was purchased quite recently, you know, within the last sort of couple of weeks. So who, who know who knows what's going to happen? But mm-hmm. certainly, the value uh, to investors of that that real, that, you know, that kind of real estate has skyrocketed. So you would think going forward, there's almost more incentive now than ever to to really restore these buildings to their original intention. Mm. What does what, what do Parkinson's buildings tell you about the spirit of Los Angeles as it was at that time? And I mean, is that a consistent spirit the city has retained? Is it one the city has lost? Is it, what is it? What do you, what do you understand about Los Angeles when you examine closely John Parkinson's buildings and, or, or understand about the, the, the engine of, uh, the engine that built the, that expanded the city so much back then? Remember, John Parkinson arrived in Los Angeles in 1894. The population is just over 50,000. When he dies in 1935, the population is well over a million. He's the dominant architect during a transition where Los Angeles goes from being an outpost to a major metropolis. These buildings really speak to the forward-thinking nature of the city. They're really a bold statement that we're prepared prepared and ready to build a city from nothing, literally from the ground up. And you can look at these structures and say, we're really setting ourselves the highest ideals. Mm. We're cr- trying to create a city that really inspires its population. And I, th- I, I still look at Parkinson structures and think, you know, anything's possible here. Mm. And I don't, I, don't th- I don't think that kind of spirit ever lost, left Los Angeles. Mm. 
Are there any buildings you can look at now and get that same feeling? Uh, buildings more recently constructed that anything is possible? Do any of these skyscrapers around us give you that sense? Does, does anything equal Parkinson's buildings to, to give you that feeling of Los Angeles and its belief in possibility? Well, you know, when you look at the growth of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. there's never going to be, well, I hate to say never, but there's only one time when the city invents itself. Mm -hmm. It's almost unfair to look at structures today and say, do you feel the same way? Because so much of Los Angeles came to life you know, in, at the dawn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It was an incredible growth spurt where a whole city, a whole metropolis was created. Mm -hmm. We see skyscrapers go up now, and you know, they're incredible feats of architecture, but they'll n never likely be the same you know, reinvention of what it means mm. to be Los Angeles mm. in such a short period of time. I was reading a book about Los Angeles from the mid-60s uh, called Los Angeles, The Ultimate City by Christopher Rand. He was saying, remarking several times that people here talk more about 1980 than about next year, which would have at the time been 1965. And uh, you think about forward-thinking nature. Today, you see it in terms of, well, the city is getting denser, the city is filling in, there's going to be more transit. You know, look forward to that time. The, the sense of, well, just wait, just wait and see what the city will be like in 20 years. You know, boy, just you wait. That has never gone away, has it? And not at all. Hmm. Not at all. I mean, I think Los Angeles, more than perhaps any city in America, is, al is always imagining the future. Hmm. You know, that's what, that's what I think that's a central theme of... Uh, the whole existence of the city, it's always considered itself, at least, you know, uh, when the population got into the hundreds of thousands, it's always seen itself as the city of the future. And I don't think that's, that's ever changed at all. Mm. Do you, when you hear that sentiment, like, well, wait and see, you know, the, 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 next, the next great iteration of the city is just around the corner, do you think that that's literally true? Have we... Has the city been steadily improving itself, or is that... Uh, I don't want to say mirage, because that's a little bit... That, that's more negative than I mean it to be, because I, I think the, the advancements of Los Angeles, especially in recent years, are real. But is that sense... Is, is the city really developing in that way, do you think, or is that simply the attitude that keeps it going day to day? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think, I think this... I mean, you could ask that question to a to hundred different people in the city, and then they'd probably all give you a different answer. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain elements of the city. Um, I mean, when you have a population the size of Los Angeles, it's, it, it's inevitable that some of the areas that have been run down, you know, assuming the money exists, are going to get renovated, they're going to come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always this desire... Uh, you know, to construct new things and, and, and look at things differently here. So I... I you know, I don't, I don't think that's ever, ever really changed. Now, this project on John Parkinson began, and the idea, correct me if I'm wrong, began as, as a documentary. And, and uh, why, was, why was that the first choice for you when the idea first came to you, to, to, make, to use that medium? Well, I mean, I, I work in television. And my, main, my main job is to work, uh, I work for a British TV network. Um, I like the idea of being downtown. I really wanted a story that kind of fitted you know, my existing skill set and a documentary made sense. And there'd never been a documentary about John Parkinson. Uh, there'd never been really anything about John right. Parkinson. Um, you know, so I, I, I applied for lots and lots of grants because it, it's an expensive process. Archive footage is particularly expensive. And I got consistently got the same response, which was, I would ring up afterwards and say, well, look, you didn't give me this money. I've, I spent three months doing this application. I understand that lots of other people apply, but I thought I put it together a pretty good pace. case. Can you um, give me some feedback on why you, you, you didn't like my application? And one thing came back all the time, and it was, well, we'd never heard of John Parkinson, and uh, you know, we, we rang around some people who know Los Angeles, and they've, no, they've never heard of John Parkinson either. So we, you know, we're really sorry. We can't, we can't give you this money. Mm. And um, one day I just kind of sat at work and I thought, well, I've been so obsessed with this story for so long and done so much research that um, I could write a book about him. Mm. You know, and I, I wrote a letter to uh, Angel City Press, who I always thought would be a fantastic publisher for this book. 
And, um, you know, fortunately that they were into the idea, mm. you know, and now I'm trying to use the book really to bring attention to the documentary and to find that funding to finish it. So, um, ho hopefully, you know, one will feed off the other. Reading the book, it certainly seems like a suitable form for the story of John Parkinson, especially because, because you can take some time looking at the photographs, looking at the images. But what would the documentary bring to the understanding of his story that, that the book necessarily can't? Or what are the, what are the comparative strengths of each of them, I suppose? Well, f firstly, um, you know, I have to sell the idea to people to read a book. Basically, say, I have to say to people that, um, this is a book about the greatest architect in the history of your city. You know, please read it. You know, if I show them a film, they can just sit there and enjoy it. It's a much easier medium to that take. Passiveness about it. Absolutely. It's a much, it's a much easier medium to take in. Mm. But I, I think that the, the two complement each other because when, when you, you look at footage of the Coliseum under construction, when you look at footage of City Hall under construction, it's very real. We have a lot of film footage of that still around. It still exists, and um, I'm I'm lucky enough to have access to uh, some of John Parkinson's home movies as well. So, you know, when you see these people move around, when you see these buildings go up, when you see the workers that put them together, um, it really adds to the human experience of what this means. I mean, my my ultimate hope is that people would, you know, watch the movie, go and read the book, and feel the whole experience. You know, I think they're they're two very different mediums and two different, very different ways of losing yourself in a story. When people learn the story of John Parkinson, what what do, especially Angelinas, people who live here, what do you think they? What's what sort of? I don't want to say knowledge, but what does their experience of Los Angeles stand to gain from learning about him and his buildings? Well, I think, I think. You know, when going back to um, something we kind of touched on earlier, you know, these buildings are very relevant. Mm. I think it's much it's much easier to love and enjoy the place that you live if you understand what it is. Mm. If you understand the history, you're more inclined to care about the place that you live in. You're more inclined to want the city, you know, to live up to the potential of the original intention. Mm. I mean, for, for me, when I see these buildings downtown, I really want people to, to, to read this book or read any book about Los Angeles and really care about the environment and just care about preserving this incredible history that we have, even though a lot of people will try and tell you that L.A. doesn't have any history. Do, do you think Los Angeles, people who live here know especially less about their city than people of other major cities in the world? I think I think that's possible. Mm. I mean, I, I I wouldn't want to stereotype anything because there are a lot of people that are very passionate about Los Angeles history that know an incredible amount about the city. But I think it's the same in 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 all modern cities that there's so many distractions, there's so many other things to think about that unless you have a particular passion for history, you're really not going to get stuck in and understand it. But mm. in short, yes, probably. Los, you know, Angelinos are probably a little bit more guilty of uh, not understanding where they came from than other cities. When you have uh, friends or family visiting from England or elsewhere, from somewhere that isn't Los Angeles, what do you, what do you try to get across to them? What's what's first in terms of just making sure they they don't approach the city in a way that's not advantageous to them? But, I mean, whenever I have anybody come and visit, I mean, the number one thing that I, I just really f firstly try and work on shattering that, that, especially if they've never been here, that image of what they have in their head, you know, and. Is it always the same image? Yes, pretty much. Um, and just saying to them that there, there are really fascinating things all over this city. There are fascinating blends of culture that, don't exist anywhere else, you know. And then, if if um, if I feel that they're up for it, I'll give them the downtown tour of, of Parkinson structures just to, uh, you know, cap off the part of history that I really understand. What what connections do you find between? I mean, he, Parkinson worked in several American cities. He built in several American cities. Is there? Is did he simply go where? I guess go is sometimes too active. Or what was it? Was it that? He found opportunity in these cities. He found the most in Los Angeles, but he, he built wherever he did have the opportunity. Or is there something 
can you can you draw connecting lines between the cities that he built in? You know, Seattle, of course, is another major one. But what what is it about the cities, or the era in the cities Parkinson built in that that made them places he could build? I think I think the the um, consistent theme through all of them, whether it's um, you know whether it's Seattle, Salt Lake City, or da- uh, you know Dallas, mm. all all these structures. Uh, all these uh, cities that he's working in are going through incredible growth spurts. Mm. And it's not just uh, a growth spurt in an existing city. It's almost as if these places are all creating themselves. Mm. So he's really um, dipping into markets that are really establishing themselves. And I think that's what's so, ex- that's what's so exciting about existing in that, in that time period that, you know, it's not like if you went to Seattle now, everybody has an established image of what, Seattle is, or if you came to Los Angeles, people have an established idea of what the city is. This is a period when these cities were really inventing and creating what they were going to be in the future. Seattle, Salt Lake City, Los Angeles, these were all to themselves the cities of the future at some time. I mean, I grew up in Seattle, and I was thinking about Seattle, reading the Seattle sections of Iconic Vision, because you think, boy, Seattle really thought of itself... Uh, in post Parkinson, I mean, maybe in the 50s and 60s as the city of the future. And I, I would say, as somebody from there, it never delivered on that promise. I mean, it's, they're in some ways still in hock to the image of the Space Needle or, or, you know, grunge music later than that. Uh, American cities, though, when they're big enough, they all, they all kind of go through that phase, don't they? This, this is the future. The future's here. They, they need that kind of, not just optimism, but, Conviction. To, they needed that to raise themselves, didn't they? When you look at the, the, the sort of the, the the unique experience of America, having having the having the funds, you know, and the economic might to really create, you know, and the land really just to create yourself. It didn't really exist. I mean, you, you're perhaps seeing it in some ways in you know parts of China now, but I, I don't know if it, it, even that really compares to what happened here. Mm. I mean, such a such an, a, a massive evolution within a short period of time. Right. No, no city in England had to see itself as the city of the future. I take it. Um, no, not not in the same way. I think you know most most British uh, cities have existed for so long that they've reinvented themselves over and over and over again. Mm. I mean, the, I guess the cool thing about this time time period that Parkinson is in is really the first time they did it. Mm. That would the, the the era Parkinson was building was that first era of reinvention. Um, in terms of Los Angeles being a metropolis, mm. yeah. Mm. Now this this show will record some episodes in London early next year. So, I, I I haven't heard many parallels drawn between Los Angeles and London. Are there any to be drawn? Do you think is that is that is that possible? To I mean, they're both huge. Let's say that they're both places that if you're tired of them, you're tired of life. We've established. I feel like there's something deeper that, that I could observe between the two, but I'm not sure what. Uh, other maybe they're just because they're both big cities. People talk about. I don't know, but. I feel like there's some. Is it is it about the way cultures meet in them? What, what direction could I go in for that? I'm not asking you to be an authority on London because you're for, because you're English, but do you think there's anything to that? I mean, it, you know, for the for most of people um, in in Los Angeles, get it back in their car. That makes a huge difference to how you interact with people. Mm. It, it's the it you know. It's quite easy to live your life in Los Angeles and you never really meet people on a day-to-day basis other than those people that you work with, yeah. you know. Um, London is a much more social city in the sense that you're forced to interact with people. Yeah. Uh, you're forced to, to be on the streets, walk around, you know, go, go on public transportation um, and have a day-to-day interaction with people that you just don't have in the same way here. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people do. There are parts of life, parts of the city you can live in where that happens, but I would say... I haven't bought a car myself yet. I'm afraid of that. I I think having a car, not having a car in Los Angeles is a fantastic opportunity to really get to understand the city Mm -hmm. in a way that most other people don't. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm hoping anyway, for the last few years I've been hoping. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm envious. I think one of the really cool things about you know, people being able to live downtown and all this uh, business coming into the city is the idea that you could give up your car, mm. you know, which seems impossible in Los Angeles. But what a, what a wonderful notion that you could live in this incredibly sunny, warm, optimistic climate and abandon your automobile. 
I was speaking on this show a few weeks ago with your countryman, the novelist Richard Rayner, who has lived in Los Angeles, I think, 30 years or so, never once having learned to drive. And so I think that became kind of a, I don't know if it's a badge of honor, but maybe a sort of a, he, he enjoyed the stubbornness of not doing it. He was saying, I think they're mostly recidivist Englishmen like me who have been not driving here that long. But you've, you've been living here since, as we've said, as we've said the mid nineties. So you have yourself seen, that's, that's really the shortest period where you can see the transformation from really absolutely needing a car, unless you're Richard Rayner, to being able to not have one and the implications of that. I mean, I would, I would wager you've seen not a whole transformation of the city in, in that period, but a transformation of a lot of ideas about the city since then. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I guess so. I mean, I guess so. I mean, I guess when, when you first move here, I don't think you spend that much time thinking about the deeper issues of the transition <laughs> of the city. You're just trying to survive. Yes. Um, you know, when you, when you look back on it and you, you do notice that there are uh, whole areas where you can now live and uh, you know get a, get about without without a car uh, that didn't didn't exist when I first came here. I mean, particularly downtown. I mean, the idea of uh, living downtown is very attractive now. And you know, as you say, in 1995, it probably really wasn't. <laughs> yes, I mean, 1995. I've, I hear from people who are very long time residents. The mid 90s were maybe the darkest time they remember in Los Angeles history, where it's it's riots and floods and fires and O.J. Simpson and it, all that all that stuff together. It's you know, you watch Los Angeles. Movies from the mid '90s, and they're all about the destruction of Los Angeles, some sort of apocalypse taking place in Los Angeles, or Michael Douglas uh, going on a rampage through Los Angeles. I guess it wasn't so bad if you just got here, though, right? Living in Los Angeles requires a lot of patience. Yeah. Uh, it requires uh, an ability to let things go, you know, uh, not to be bothered by things, and, um, and much, much as many big cities do. But yeah. I think because um, there's that lack of human interaction. I think we, we really kind of uh, forget how to really deal with each other sometimes. Mm, that's, it's one of those. It's one of those ways that you that you I, and I, when I say you, I mean, it's an experience. I suppose you you went through yourself. You know, doing a book like Iconic Vision, you had to do a lot of research into Los Angeles. Had to come into contact with a lot of people of Los Angeles who know a lot about the city. You had to go to places you wouldn't have gone before. I mean, sometimes it takes doing a project like this to really to to expand expand your sense of the city enough to where you feel like you are living in it in in, in a non isolated way. You know what I mean? All right. I mean, one, one of the things I found fun about reading the old, old newspapers from the 20s is that you, you realize that a lot of these things about Los Angeles, tra traffic jams, mm. air pollution, problems finding parking, that you think are all very modern problems, are all going on in the 20s. Right, right. It, you know, in fact, when you see old film footage of uh, downtown in the 1920s, there's often traffic jams, <laughs> you know, cars backed up people struggling to find parking spaces and it it just kind of puts a smile on your face that that's that's been a part of the LA experience for the best part of a hundred years mm. when you began researching John Parkinson you couldn't find an expert on John Parkinson now I suppose you're the expert tell me what it's like to be the expert on John Parkinson um, researching John Parkinson's story was it was a real privilege you know and it, it's a very humbling privilege because you realize that you take on a set, whenever you write a biography of somebody that's contributed so much to a city, you realize um, that you, you have an obligation. It's much more than just, you know, researching a story because it's, it, it, it's an opportunity to write a book or it's an opportunity to do something. It really becomes about, you know, trying to, to uh, best reflect that person's experience, mm. you know, because especially doing the first book on somebody, this is the first major statement about somebody's life, mm. you know, and there are still people connected to this story, uh, family members that, that are impacted by how you describe somebody, how you describe these different events in their life. And it, 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 it is a privilege, but it, it's also a responsibility as well. Mm. And I would imagine the next whole wide-scale architectural histories to be written will have to include much more about John Parkinson than they had. I mean, did the architectural histories of Los Angeles you had read before just 
I mean, they included his name, but I, I guess they must have just felt they must now feel like they have a big gap in them. But how did they how did they handle the issue of John Barkinson? Just he's an Englishman who built this building, as you said before. Well, you know, th- there's been a book. There's been books written about Bullock's Wheelshire. Yeah. Uh, there's been books written about Union Station. It's always just the one building, though. Right. Or, or there, there is, you know, books that would deal with the the greatest hits of Los Angeles architecture, yes. and you'll see little sections in there about John Parkinson. Mm-hmm. I mean, the the fun thing for me was taking all these different uh, iconic structures or iconic buildings and putting them all in one place mm-hmm. and saying this guy had a hand in all of these structures, you know, because all of his work is recognizable. It, it's all important and meaningful. But when you put it into one place, I think it's quite powerful. Mm-hmm. I think it's quite a, once you can judge this whole man's entire career in one place and flick through these pages and look at what he did, I think it's really incredible. Even though you were doing all this research about John Parkinson, tell me what it taught you when you got it all into one place, when you could see the whole picture about Parkinson. What what was then revealed to you that the the thousands of pieces of knowledge you had gathered painstakingly had not by themselves or in their small groups? When you get the whole thing together, what did you then see about John Parkinson? I think the remarkable thing is that there's so many things going on at the same time. You know, I mean, for example, there was one week in um, in 1916 when uh, John Parkinson goes into the uh, office of building inspector J.J. Backers for three different permit uh, applications for a uh, construction that would be worth well over $250 million in today's money. And you, you think, you know, that's one week. That, that's, that's one week. You know, the, I mean, the guy was phenomenally busy. Yeah. But, I mean, just looking at the research process, though, I mean, there were certain things that I, I would figure out late at night when I was trying to sleep that would keep me up all night. Mm. But that that's part of the, the fun of doing the book. What, do you, what sense do you have of how John Parkinson got to be so ambitious? Because this is a, certainly, certainly you don't speculate much about how his personality got to be like it, uh, like it was, but this is, this is a guy who was driven in an unusual way or ambitious in an unusual way or maybe even audacious in an unusual way at a certain point. I think he just had a, a, a very uh, almost like built-in sense of self-confidence. Mm. You know, even even when, you know, he, he left school, he left school when he was 13. Even then, you kind of get the sense that even though he was doing these jobs where he's working in a hardware store or sweeping floors, you know, in the newspaper offices, he always knows, there's always a sense that he knew he was meant for big things. Mm. And I think, you know, after a while, I think he must just have developed a, a sense of destiny. Mm. You know, I, the fact that he was bold enough to bid for, for major structures, to design major structures after he's just designed one building, mm. you know, it really shows you what he's going through. But if you look at the arc of John Parkinson's career, the first building he designs is an addition uh, to the Bank of Napa, you know, which is a fairly modest building. Uh, the next project he works on is uh, the elevations for an office building in, in uh, Fresno. And then after that, you see these enormous office structures that he's building in Seattle. Nice. And there's really very little that happens in between. Just a jump forward. It's a, it's a massive. It's a, upward. It's a massive leap. Mm. You know, it's not like it, it, you know this guy, you know, starts off building houses for five years and then he gets into building small office structures and then he mm. goes from medium and large office structure. He pretty much goes from an office structure to an enormous office structure mm. and enormous hotels, enormous buildings, and. You know, and that's really where I think he was convinced true architectural glory came in by designing the major public structures. And I think, you know, he always wanted to design a city hall. And I think when I look at city hall, I think that's the completion of that ambition. That's the ultimate expression of Parkinson's ambition. That sense of being destined for greatness is not unknown in Los Angeles. For many people here, you know, the stereotype is everybody thinks they're destined for greatness here, usually in an unwarranted fashion. But John Parkinson was, was the, almost the, 
how how to put it, and the embodiment of the the genuine that 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 feeling in its genuine version. He he really was destined to to make the, the mark of greatness here. Then right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, he was absolutely the right man in the right time, you know, the right place at the right time, mm. and I. I I don't think he ever really had any self-doubt. Even when he, he starts work, you know, in a sawmill, he doesn't, you know, he start, he gets a job in a sawmill when he first uh, moves to uh, Minneapolis, and he's never built stairs. Mm. But he knows that he, he has the right kind of brain to adapt itself to that, you know, that kind of work. And within 18 months, he's the foreman of the sawmill. Mm. You know, and all these things, you know, he moves to Seattle, he doesn't know anybody in Seattle. Nobody wants to hire him. He sets up business for himself. Within two years, he's one of the most dominant architects in Seattle. Comes to Los Angeles. Nobody in Los Angeles knows him. You know, and within uh, two years, he designs the city's first steel frame structure. Within eight years, he designs the city's first skyscraper. It's a serious hustle, we would call it. it ab absolutely. But I, I think, you know, that's a consistent... There's no point in being the world's greatest architect if you're not a salesman. Mm. If you can't sell your own ability, then nobody else is going to do it for you. And I think he, he absolutely understood that. And I think, I, th I think he, you know, he was a potent mixture of uh, uh, ambition and also charisma because you needed that um, that concoction to really get on in life. Uh, there's a telling anecdote that he, he wrote about where he, I think this was in his actual words that you quote, but he was saying, Parkinson was, that he went back to visit uh, visit England and he noticed the people that he used to know had gotten so old. He was saying, oh, am I an old man like them? Clearly he didn't feel like he had even really aged in a way that a normal person does. I, I, I don't think life never, I don't think it ever stopped being exciting for him. Mm. You know, I mean, it's remarkable to think what it would have been like to go back to Bolton where his family still lived, you know, and you think about this guy who used to ship back these expensive American cars mm -hmm. and he, he, he would drive up these cobbled streets in the industrial north of England and go visit his family. And you wonder, well, well, what, how would they understand his experience? What would they think of their relative that comes back with all the trappings of American success? But, mm -hmm. you know, the, I don't think because of the period that he lived in, that 40-year real estate boom, I don't think it ever got boring. Mm. I think it must have just been an incredible time to be alive. Mm. Now, as, as you've pointed out to me before we were recording, you look out the windows of this conference room here in the U.S. Bank Tower, you see, you see fragments of that time to be alive embodied in a few John Parkinson buildings visible from here. You also see many other times. I mean, you can look out these windows and see several different periods of Los Angeles all put together. How do you... How do you think Parkinson's buildings fit in in, in in the context of downtown today? You know, do, do you think they they look like they're the most uh, they're the most suitable structures still in this downtown area, or how do they how do they engage with what has sprouted around it? Well, I, I mean, I, to me, when I look at downtown, I think the Parkinson structures still work. Mm. I think the ones that surround it don't, uh, and I. See. I, I, I if, you know, that's a, all of them. No, that's a that's a massive generalization. But you know, it's particularly when you go down to, you know, Pershing Square and the original idea of the, the buildings that go around Pershing Square. You see the Biltmore Hotel, you know, you see the Title Guarantee Building, and you think fantastic, it's beautiful. You see some of the other buildings down there, and you think, well, I don't know if that blend entirely works. I mean, it's it's a reflection of the modernization of of the city. You know, fair enough. But I. I the fact that all these buildings that we've been discussing were built within the same the same time period, there's a consistency that I can particularly enjoy. And I think a lot of them have stood the test of time. And they st they're still structures that you can stand back and enjoy today. And that I don't think that's ever changed. Mm. Would there be potentially space for the sort of John Parkinson of the 2010s to be working today? Or is that window permanently closed for that type of architect? Well, I, you know, if, if John Parkinson existed today and he walked into an office, an architecture office, I'm sure that he would be obsessed with all the new technologies. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think he would look through uh, the same sort of vision that existed then. I think he would adapt and he would just, he would build skyscrapers and he would enjoy the whole fun of getting the latest technic technology into it. I think 
However, the, what, what he would build would still have a simple elegance to it. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't, you know, I th I'm often reminded of a quote that he gave to the Los Angeles Times at the, the, the dawn of the 20th century where they asked him what, what was his wish or what was his wish for the city going forward. And he said that, I really wish that LA would do away with those riotous forms of architecture. Riotous forms. And, and, you know, and I, I look at some of the buildings now and I think, I wonder if Parkinson would think that's a riotous form of architecture. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think he definitely believed that Los Angeles or the buildings in Los Angeles should be something that inspired people, mm. that made people, um, almost, uh, you know, want to look up and, and feel that they had a standard that they should all share and live up to. The John Parkinson of today, then, he might be the one building the skyscraper that's supposed to to out-height the one we're sitting in right now, the one under construction, but under him it would look quite a bit different, I would imagine, than the plans for that building. You know, I, I actually, I, I mean, I like the design for that building. It looks very interesting, but... Um, Wouldn't be a Parkinson building, though. Do, do you know what? I... I it's, I mean, it, the comparison's really hard, but I, I, I mean, I don't think that's a riotous form of architecture by any means. Right. It, it's an incredible feat of architecture that they're pulling off. But um, I, I would, I, I think, if John Parkinson came back and saw what is possible now, that he he would love it. I think he he would be absolutely in his element. I've been speaking with Stephen G. He's a senior producer at ITV Studios, and he's the author of Iconic Vision, John Parkinson, Architect of Los Angeles. Stephen, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Humberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andrzej Kudlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Plosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Wagelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.